Thanks everybody for coming as every, as we're getting settled here. Um, welcome to this expert-led panel of discussions on investing in biotech. Um, having met these incredible women earlier this morning, I want to say this is, I can assure you it's going to be a fascinating discussion. Um, what we These women are joining us from very diverse areas of biotech, and we want to kind of give you a comprehensive overview of, of the field of investing, from startups to mature companies, um, to talk about strategies for success. So to give brief, brief introductions, um, first we have Kirsten Leuter, who's a partner at Osage University Partners. Um, she's responsible for relationships with more than 100 different universities and academic institutions. They partner with their fund. Um, they look at creating value-add programs for partnering academic institutions. Kirsten is an experienced tech transfer professional, spending almost two decades at Stanford and at the German Cancer Research Institute. She's been at Osage for about a decade now, and um, we've worked together a, a long time. Both of us are only 30, so, you know, we... <laughs> Um, next, we have Dr. Jenna Aronson. She's a neuroscientist and MIT alum. Um, Jenna is a principal at Two Bear Capital. They are focused on sourcing deer flow, conducting diligence, and supporting portfolio companies. Um, she's passionate about biotech investing. She enjoys mentoring MIT entrepreneurs as a Sandbox Innovation Fund fellow. She's a VP for finance for the MIT Biotech Group and a former executive member of Gap Summit. And also joining us is Dr. Christina Kiko. She's a uh, fellow and MIT alum and a neuroscientist and engineer turned technologist, um, also a graduate of Vanderbilt. She is the associate director of venture science with Eli Lilly. She supports early engagement with external opportunities uh, as part of Lilly's strategy, looking at seed and series B investments. And then also joining us is Dr. Pooja Majumder, Majmudar, sorry. Uh, she's the director of, start, of startup banking at Silicon Valley Bank. She leads the early stage life science startup banking practice um, in the Northeast and the area east of the Rockies. And she has knowledge and experience working with early stage founders, life science investors. She looks to solutions to startups and improving their likelihood of success and sort of building those connections. So we uh, want to thank all of them for joining us and um, get started with just a general question for all of you guys. Um, what excites you most about the current landscape of biotech investing? Um, thank you so much, Nicole, for, for the introduction. Uh, great to be here with all the panelists. Um, uh, I know Nicole introduced me, but wanted to share this since it's probably uh, on your mind, Silicon Valley Bank, we survived. Um, <laughs> and, and we are now banked by a 125-year-old stable bank called First Citizens that's headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, you know, with the acquisition for citizens is now the 20, 20th largest commercial bank um, in the country. And what they decided after the acquisition was SVB was too important for the innovation ecosystem. And they decided to leave SVB as SVB. Um, we are still doing the same thing that we did prior to March 9th and 10th is serving the innovation economy. So my role um, is working with early stage startups. So going back to Nicole's question, um, what is exciting uh, me in, in you know, uh, these days? A couple of things, but what comes to top of mind is um, the use of generative AI. So again, uh, I won't be surprised if generative AI is is named uh, Time Magazine People of the Year <laughs> <laughs> at at, uh, at some point in time because uh, you know it's uh, it's it's doing incredible things in the um, in the healthcare space, uh, not just from you know helping uh, mine farm uh, the huge data sets that are available you know in in the healthcare ecosystem. Um, so that's that's one side. I can delve a little deeper on that. But on the other side, um, I'm really excited about the innovations uh, that are coming out in women's health. So our SVB, we do a lot of. Um, uh, you know, reports throughout the year in various subsectors. Our mid-year healthcare investments and exit report uh, came out in June 2023. And, you know, we had a, a small segment on, you know, the women's health landscape, the 
the the funding and investment environment hasn't been pretty. Uh, it's been a bloodbath. Uh, and the women's health space hasn't, you know, been spared. But having said that, when you look at the trends from 2018 to 2023, there's been a 349% uptick in investments in, in women's health. And that's exciting to me as a mom, uh, as a woman, uh, uh, as a mom of two girls. Uh, and, and and just the very fact that this industry has been sidelined for such a long time. So um, that that is exciting for me. And I'm, I'm really always super excited and amped to meet women founders and also founders are working in women's health space. Which on that note, I just want to say thank you to James and Elaine for putting together the awesome women's panel here. <laughs> that we can... um, sure. So I think two things. Um, so one is actually um, the kind of evolution that we're seeing of how platform companies are dealing with pipeline access. Um, and so what I mean by that is to say something super broad, which is that, you know, no matter what sort of therapeutic area you're in. Um, a lot of these platform companies that we're seeing have, you know, really, they're built on really cool technologies, but they're actually spinning out more assets and more targets than, you know, as a startup company, you are, uh, you know, reasonably able to think about commercializing downstream. And so one of the things that um, both, uh, you know, ourself and some of our other peer pharmas have been doing have been, has been, to think about alternative models for engagement for those assets. Um, and so we have a model called Catalyze where we actually will take those assets and par partner them for uh, sort of backloaded milestones. So we see that as a way to actually get more things into trials, to get more things through trials and uh, you know, ultimately, if we right, even as big pharma, right, if we could predict, you know, what was going to, um, you know, at the end of the line, be the winner, we would all be out of jobs because we would have that and be done. Um, and so we see that as a good thing that you know we're really getting more things to more patients um, in a sort of more efficient and capital efficient manner. Is it on? Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, love being on this panel uh, with other phenomenal females. So thank you for putting this together. Um, so I think you guys have both touched on really kind of exciting points that are that are happening in the space. Um, I'd like to highlight another area that I'm very excited about what's been happening over sort of the previous year. And I think will um, also, you know, bode well for the future. And that's really in the, the space of neuro. And so neuro has traditionally been a very, very tricky area to develop therapeutics in. And part of the reason is we, you know, didn't have good understanding of the uh, what's underlying those diseases, especially neurodegenerative diseases, uh, you know, what's happening at the cell molecular level and, um, you know, what genetic drivers uh, differentiate patients into subpopulations. And so um, I think that it's very exciting that recent advances have allowed us to, uh, you know, basic science research has allowed us to understand what's happening and how to differentiate groups in order to develop more targeted therapies. And, you know, um, both on the institutional as well as strategic investment side, we're very excited about therapeutics that really have a strong connection to the underlying genetics. Um, I, you know, this is really helpful. If you take a look at what's happened sort of in the field of, of cancer or oncology, it used to be that when you had um, a tumor, the way that it was diagnosed is, hey, where in the body is that tumor located? Um, you know, what organ is it next to? And that would be, you know, how the treatment approach, um, you know, would go forward. Now, at this point, you can do sequencing, you can understand what the driver mutations are, and you can have a targeted therapy. And so we're able to make much more progress in the oncology space because of that. And I see the same thing happening in neuro. And the second thing that's happening in neuro that's really exciting. Um, if you've been following the news, uh, Toferson was approved in ALS. And what was really exciting is that there was a blood-based biomarker, neurofilament light, that was also given the thumbs up from the FDA as uh, a biomarker that could be used for monitoring um, success and response to the therapy. And that's huge for the neurofield because 
we really need these biomarkers in order to understand in real time or you know in short order our patients responding to therapies and that will allow us to create a positive feedback loop to really develop therapies that are um, effective and safe and to identify the populations that are you know going to respond to them so i'm excited for what's been happening and what's going to happen in the neurospace so those are all really solid science answers. <laughs> I'm going to take a little bit of a um, different tack on um, my answer to this question. And it's based on my experience, which is more on 30 years in, in the technology transfer, startup, et cetera, um, world. Sorry for the feedback. Um, and, and what I'm excited about is, you know, having seen this space evolving over time is the fact that um, people have really come out of their... Or groups have come out of their silos and started working um, together more and saying that we can actually do this if we better if we actually all work together. So um, uh, the um, scientists at the universities um, are much more uh, willing to collaborate with one another. More and more we see startups that are multi-institutional startups. So they don't have IP just from one institution. They have IP from lots of different institutions, and they're figuring out how to work together, um, uh, or they're they're collaborating. And the piece of IP actually just has inventors from uh, multiple institutions associated associated with them. Uh, the institutions themselves are trying to do more um, proof of concept funding, gap funding, trans tra translational research funding to develop the um, uh, technologies more. Uh, and then the strategics are coming in and saying, "Hey, we'd like to help with this as well," and we get a, a sense of what is going on with this uh, earlier. So this could be something that we could be interested perhaps down the line. And so it's just this um, sense that people are all trying to, groups are trying to work together and actually make this much more efficient than it used to be instead of people working uh, in their silos. So that's one of the things that most excites me um, about what's going on. The other thing that excites me, um, and this is because uh, I think my superpower is being an optimist and being an enthusiast, <laughs> is that um, everyone's, you know, like, yes, startups are having a lot harder time with funding right now. Um, it's, it's, it's a very um, difficult environment out there right now. But the fact is, there's a lot of capital, capital out there. Um, it is it is there and it is going to be deployed at some point because it has to be deployed. <laughs> that's, that's part of what the, the, the funders uh, do. Um, so to me, things are going to progress and it is part going to progress because of the, the science that hasn't stopped at the institutions. So I'll pause there. I'm sure I have more to say on this. <laughs> well, actually, I'm going to stay with you and, and, and build on your optimism and your wisdom. Um, but talk a little bit since you've lived in both worlds about how academic institutions and venture capital firms work together in this space and you know what you see from the big view and what you see with Osage also. Yeah. So I'm going to again take my historical perspective on this because um, so I did um, almost 20 years of tech transfer, mostly at Stanford University. And it's funny because we used to have people from, you know, Sand Hill Road come down and talk with us and be like, so what are you seeing that's really great? And we're like, why don't you just go talk to the researchers, <laughs> you know, which was not Honestly, I look back on it now and I'm kind of embarrassed that that's, that's how we, that was our approach. Um, because people have realized really that that's not the best approach to be like, oh, you should just go talk to those people. And it is, it, it worked for Silicon Valley at the beginning, but everyone's figured out actually having a formal process and having the people who kind of understand, here's what's happening at the university. And let me direct through you to the right people. What is it that you're interested in? Let me direct you to the right people that you actually should be talking about this. And so this isn't just on the venture capital side, but it's on the corporate side as well. So to have um, a much more, a better way of these engagements to happen um, is, so that's one of the things that I've seen, which has really changed and, um, uh, and, and be much more effective. I love it that institutions now, um, they have lists of their entrepreneurial opportunities, their early stage startups, their mid-stage startups, and they can pass those out to all the venture capital groups that they work with. That makes it much more efficient for us as venture capital groups to be able to um, look at these opportunities and decide, is there something that we want to have an intro on? Um, instead, rather than just being told, here, let me introduce it to all these different groups. Well, we may, we, may not, we may not be interested in all those different groups. So having it customized for those types of relationships, uh, that relationship building is really important. Um, so this is a couple of the things um, that I've seen. I, I don't know if anyone else wants to answer that one. 
I mean, uh, since I've spent uh, quite a bit of time, not as much as Kirsten, uh, in tech transfer, I got my feet wet at um, Rutgers. I've definitely seen a shift uh, in the last decade for the better. Um, you know, tech transfer offices uh, were essentially gatekeepers, right, um, for companies to come in and and bridge those connections with uh, early stage, uh, you know, scientists or founders. But now I've seen uh, a shift in, you know, tech transfer offices being uh, more adept at supporting founders who really want to go the entrepreneurship route. So, for example, you know, Columbia, Duke, a lot of these progressive tech transfer offices now ha have been able to pull together resources, not just to provide gap funding to de-risk early stage technologies, but also provide in-house expertise by way of, you know, having EIRs or bringing in, you know, the experts, the consultants, the talent that early stage founders need to, you know, speak with, you know, uh, get information from. So, yeah, I, I see a positive shift uh, in the last decade in, in tech transfer and how they're bridging the connection between early stage founders and industry. And I'll just add one final point um, from the investor side that I can say um, that everything that you guys have been speaking to is certainly true. And we felt it um, that tech transfer offices are reaching out to us and saying, hey, we'd love to get you involved to, you know, um, give you opportunities to give uh, advice to our you know, our founders who are working on innovations, whether they've spun out of the lab yet or are, you know, just thinking about it, you know, just to get that early feedback loop to really pressure test ideas before they, they spin out and um, to build those relationships. And, um, you know, at, at every opportunity at different conferences, for example, at Bio, I have had outreach from tech transfer offices. In fact, that's the reason why I'm here. So James, <laughs> you know, asked for a meeting at, at Bio, and we had a great conversation. And, I, and you know, this is um, the development of that relationship. And so I think we can see that really actively happening here. Yeah, I think that is something that's really shifted in the in the approach um, for most universities, and their their tech transfer has evolved into engagement. You know, it's innovation, it's partnership, it's engagement. And whether you're a public or a private university, um, we know that we 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 serve our publics by connecting and pushing stuff out and connecting whether the, you know, with the small companies, large companies, but it's more than just an invention, a patent, uh, you know, come what you can get from us. Um, so Kristen, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about from Eli Lilly, how you see this and your investment strategy and what works, you know, with how people interact with you. Yeah, so I I think everything that you ladies have said resonates. Um, I will say, you know, also to be kind of, kind of the brutal realist in the room, um, you know, the engagement that we see, it's not necessarily a fair playing field. Um, you know, we have Nobel laureates that we have funded five of their companies because they have been on our board and they have a direct line of sight um, into our ventures fund. And so, um, you know, places like Stanford, I think there's also kind of this bifurcation um, that, you know, there are a few founders that have, you know, just serial numbers of companies. And, uh, you know, I think we're actually seeing more innovation from places that are not like Stanford that have to really, you know, take a step back and think about, you know, not only how do we get our academics to engage, but our trainees, our trainees are excited about biotech. You have programs like Nucleate. Um, Lily is a platinum sponsor of that where, you know, there are likely folks, I've met folks at Tulane um, and LSU actually that are engaged in programs like that. Um, and so we have, um, you know, I think models where we're not directly investing necessarily, but we are investing in kind of building the talent and uh, providing mentorship and getting folks ready to where they can ultimately pitch to Lilly. Um, and so in terms of what Lilly is interested in, um, we are the corporate venture arm of Eli Lilly. So we are not um, sort of wholly uh, siloed off from parent Lilly. So we are then interested in neurodegeneration, diabetes, pain, immunology, oncology, and genetic medicine. So we do tend to invest fairly close to what we consider our core therapeutic areas. We are a strategic investor, so we are not 
motivated by financial return. Um, for us, the goal is really bring cool science to the attention of broader Lily as early as possible with the goal of converting that either into an acquisition or a collaboration or some kind of deal within our pipeline. So we are very science driven. Everyone on our team has a PhD. Um, we're very out there in the world, like many other venture folks. Um, and, um, you know, we, we really do see it as kind of the first gateway into working with Lily is through our team. Can I just follow up on something you said, made me think that, and one of the things that we, we often talk about, um, but I, I, I'd like to mention it to this audience too, is um, when you, if you do decide to go the venture capital route, and honestly, the venture capital route, first of all, is not for everyone. It is really not for, for the vast majority of startups. And that's okay. There are a lot of other things, ways that you can raise money, and it's not as costly as venture capital. So that's a whole nother conversation that we could have, but we're not going <laughs> to. <laughs> so, but just FYI, like when you have a meeting with a venture investor, um, one of the best questions you can ask is like, um, is who else do you think, you know, on the venture side would be interested in what it is that we're doing? Because, and not even asking for the intro for them to make the introduction, because I will say that's uh, something that else is a, you know, like every time you ask a venture capitalist to give you an introduction to another venture capitalist, it's a, there's a whole system about how that works, but you can call cold call venture capitalists do <laughs> respond to cold calls, but you understanding um, who might really be the players in your particular space is really important. And you're doing their homework on that is, is incredibly important. And, um, and so, you know, when you're talking with a venture capitalist, ask them who they think actually might be interested in the space that you're actually working in. And you'll get some good names then that you can follow up and you uh, up on, you're going to have to do a lot of the legwork yourself. Um, so I just wanted to, yeah, that's, that's a, an excellent point. And I'll just add a little bit there. So absolutely. You know, I think it's, it's great if you can, you know, do your homework ahead of time and figure out maybe through LinkedIn or something else, if you have, um, you know, somebody who knows somebody at a firm that you think would be a good fit, I guess, take a step back, figure out who the right firms are in terms of the areas they invest in the stage they invest in, um, therapeutic modalities, as well as indications, all of that is really helpful because, you know, if ultimately that firm isn't going to be the right fit for you, then, um, you know, it's, it doesn't matter if you get a meeting with them. So, so do your homework ahead of time and then see if you can figure out how to get a warm introduction. But if you can't, we, we get all sorts of cold inbounds and some of them are for things that have nothing to do with the areas we invest in. And it's clearly somebody who's just you know, maybe even set up a bot to, you know, just send a lot of emails and, and we can tell when, when that's the case. And, um, you know, I think what you put into it is what you get out of it. We also get emails where somebody we've never heard of reaches out and says, hey, I saw that you invested in this company and um, that you're interested in this space and this is what we're doing. And, um, you know, here's the reasons why I really like your approach um, or, you know, your your style of investing. And that's really captivating to us. I mean, that's that shows that you know somebody has really um, thought about why we would be the right partners to work together. And um, you know, if you do go the venture capital investment route, just remember it's not just a check you're getting. This is a relationship that you're going to be forming. Oftentimes, you hear it's like a marriage because you know you're going to be working together. Call it a decade, maybe more, and maybe even longer than that. We have founders in our in our fund who have worked with us on previous startups. So you know, you, you this could be a lifetime of a relationship and. Um, you know, starting it off on the right foot and making sure that it's, you know, a good personality fit as well is, is, you know, really, really great way to, to set the stage. So I just want to piggyback on what Jenna said, and we were discussing about this last night. Um, it's, it's, there is absolutely no excuse in this day and age for you to not be able to do your homework before you approach investors. There's, there are a ton of opportunities, um, SVB, we have a program with um, Launch Bio, where uh, it's called Investor Connect, where we bring in investors and you know help founders get in front of the investors. The the founders do a one minute pitch. There's no slides. You have to be very succinct, very crisp, drive home the point, and then the investor gives a two minute feedback. So, 
that's a program. There are a lot of programs. Yesterday, one of my colleagues, we have a strategic partnership with Lab Central um, in Boston. They were doing an amazing boot camp for which we pulled in investors. We had key ecosystem stakeholders to do a half day boot camp, and it was open for all. All you have to do is just keep your eyes and ears open, network, uh, because I know cold you know, outreach works, but only to a certain extent. So whenever I work with my founders, I tell them, please plant the seeds ahead of time. Do your research because um, when, so I'm I'm the value add um, for the startup banking team at SVB. Um, and, you know, having been on the academic side, I kind of understand the, the personality um, of early stage founders, especially academicians. And, for them to do outreach is, you know, probably uh, it doesn't come naturally to them. So A, they have to get used to it. And B, you uh, you really have to do the legwork even before you form the relationship. So again, plus one on whatever, you know, Jenna and Kirsten said about, you know, venture money is not for everybody. Yes, it's not for everybody. So do do that research um, ahead of time, know who you're going to be talking to, um, you know, uh, be authentic. And yesterday, I think Christian was on a panel and he said, be be vulnerable. Justin said that, I believe, in his, in his panel session. So, yeah, be open, but be smart before you approach uh, investors. Yeah, that's great. And actually, you touched on what I was going to ask you to start with is, um, what are some of the, other than no excuses <laughs> for no homework, um, uh, what are some of the other most common pitfalls that that you see early stage biotech startups um, encounter when they're trying to secure funding? You know, when they're starting at at whatever level of funding, where where do they fall down? So, um, since my world is early stage, Series A and and earlier, I I come across a lot of founders that you know may or may not be early. You know, they've just founded a company. They don't have a lab space, they're, you know, engaging with CROs, trying to vet, you know, who to work with as early as that, or companies who've already been seeded, you know, and they're ramping up and, and fundraising to reach the Series A milestone. There are, uh, maybe, you know, this can be a, a separate topic in itself, but just want to highlight a few things that at least I have seen in my experience working with early stage founders is, I know they are strapped for cash uh, early on, and I've seen a lot of PIs just because they've worked, you know, uh, you know, in research, writing grants. They want to write their own provisional patent applications. So I'm, I'm talking about founders who have not worked with the tech transfer office, but are kind of charting their own path. You know, not investing in in strategic sector, subsector specific legal counsel in the you know, in the get-go, you know, you're trying to save dollars. But what I tell founders is, A, you're not paying for, you know, the time um, of the IP attorney. You're actually paying for uh, his or her expertise plus their network. At the end of the day, um, yesterday, this this came up again. In the early days, you have to surround yourself with the right people because they are going to be your gateway to your next connection, which may be very important uh, or critical, you know, depending on, um, you know, what your conversations are. So going back to early stage founders, you know, they don't know what kind of company, you know, they should be forming an LLC or a C Corp. Okay, you need to have, you know, the the right information, the right accounting firm, the right legal firm. Um, there are a ton of resources available at the state level. Um, you know, in terms of uh, tax credits, incentives, figure out where you want to be, what state uh, you want to have your company in. Um, and this another thing I tell early stage founders is uh, if you buy cheap, you buy twice. So it's not <laughs> that you have to put in a lot upfront because everybody understands you're a founder, your cash straps, but we have a way to work with you. So figure out who is going to be with you for the long term. Don't work with somebody who will work with you in the early stage and say, oh, by the way, you know, you should work with X vendor or service provider once you hit this milestone. No, they have to be in it with you for the long term and they have to have subsector expertise. Uh, so I can speak from a pharma 
perspective here. Um, I think the first one, short, sweet, and to the point, uh, Dave Ricks is our CEO. Do not email Dave Ricks. Uh, <laughs> that is that is not going to help, even if you play golf with him. Uh, you know, I, again, I think, you know, we talked about this previously, but, you know, take the time to make sure that you are reaching out to the right person. Um, the second thing would be, you know, if you're coming to a big pharma um, and you have a pitch deck, that is terrific. We do venture investing, um, but do not expect the world immediately. So that is one of, I think, the key things that, you know, we have folks come to us saying, I have an idea for my academic lab and it's going to change the world. I want a $20 billion partnering deal. And there's no data, right? It, for us, it is, you know, really important when you approach us to, you know, make those initial conversations realistic. And the way that I would suggest doing that is getting us excited about your science. You know, we understand that companies, you know, might not have every skill set, legal skill sets, you know, CROs in place even. Um, we are willing to work with you there if you get us excited about the science. But, uh, you know, also don't, tell us, oh, we're, well, we're going to be the next cell gene with no data and um, please write us a check. <laughs> be, be realistic. Yeah, I think um, you guys have both made excellent points. Um, one piece of advice that I remember, you know, hearing early on and that I really want to amplify here in this, um, in this space is in the excitement and the rush, um, to form a company and spin out and be an entrepreneur, don't forget that the safest place that you can be is academia. This is your warm, nurturing home environment that doesn't come with a burn rate, doesn't come with you know paying rent and you know thinking about um, you know everything that goes along with paying salaries and benefits and a lot of other pressure. You have access to core facilities. Um, you have access to partnerships and collaborations that will either not be available or be a lot more expensive in terms of getting samples. Um, so do as much as you can in academia to de-risk your science, because if you do, you'll have a better data package when you then go to raise money. And here's the thing, the most expensive money that you'll ever raise is the earliest money. So, you know, when you're taking a small seed investment from angels that you're selling equity in your company and it's very dear. And, you know, later stage, you might see these, you know, hundred million dollar plus rounds and they're selling 20% of the company, but early on you might be selling 20% of the company for $1 million. So the stronger the data package that you have, when you first go out to raise that non-dilutive capital, the better you will be for the long term. So I, I I can't emphasize this enough. Do as much as you can, you know, while you're still in academia, and um, and get it, become aware of all these opportunities that we're talking about. You know, get yourself in as many uncomfortable situations. Um, I, I talked to somebody earlier over breakfast, and we were talking about a safe place where you can have like a a total honest teardown. You know, welcome those opportunities to get that feedback. Listen iterate, do those scary, you know, experiments, the go, no go experiments that, you know, might give you an, an outcome that you don't want to hear. Don't shy away from those, do all those as much as possible. Um, and then explore non-dilutive options, you know, SBIR, SDTR grants. Those are excellent ways um, to really, um, you know, get further along before you have to, you know, go through the process of, of dilutive fundraising. I'm going to answer this one as well, because I actually think this is one of the most important questions that we can we can talk about, um, uh, because it will make everyone more successful in the, uh, the long run. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some things that you guys talked about, maybe um, go into some other thoughts on them. The, there are two top things. When we're looking at life science opportunities, there are two main things that we're looking at. There's a whole host of other things that go underneath this, but the two main things we're looking at are the science and the team. And um, for the science part that you were just talking about and the de-risking 
um, understand why you're de- what you're de-risking and why and what it is that you're doing to de-risk. And does that actually align with um, what a biotech, a pharma, et cetera, would want to see as far as de-risking? You may think that from an academic standpoint that that's what de-risking, but this is why it's important to have kind of this is this, that this going back to the collaboration and uh, bringing other voices in is, uh, you know, get people, um, advisors in who can tell you like, what are the right things to do next and why that is. Um, so um, that's from the science side. On the the team side, um, I, when I first started at um, OUP, um, I sat in a lot of our pitches, and I could almost tell right away which ones we would even talk with again. I mean, it was just within ten minutes. It's kind of like when you do a job interview with someone. Um, you have a sense, you know, like this is person is going to work out, or this person's not going to work out for this. And um, one of the one of the fatal things that would happen is that um, there would be a group pitching with us, and they didn't know who one was was supposed to speak when and about what. Like so, they didn't have uh, they did, so it was clear to us they didn't know whose job was what yet. And um, so you're developing your team, even if it's not going to be the team that's going to be forever with the company, because that rarely happens, right? We all know um, you are all, you know, mostly in academia, you know, like your team changes over time and that's okay. But we want to see that this is the right team right now for this opportunity. Um, Or if it's not the right team yet, like you're missing a position, how that's going to be filled? Or are you looking to the venture side to help you fill that particular um, position? We want it, we're investing in the people um, uh, just as much as the science. Um, the last point I'm gonna make on this is that uh, there's this wonderful um, survey that I think has been done a couple of times now um, by some people at uh, you know, uh, institutions uh, where they go out and uh, interview venture, venture capitalists. They survey the venture capitalists about why things fail versus you know they actually succeed. And if you look at overall in the, in the venture capital industry, um, why things fail or succeed um, is usually team. Um, but if you go down to life sciences, why things fail, the number one thing is the science doesn't work. The science doesn't work once they take it out of the university. And so going back to your points on de-risking, that's why de-risking is, is so um, important and why the right, perhaps, next experiments need to be done. Great. Thank you guys so much. Well, I want to give every all of you guys a chance to ask questions about investing or strategies or things like that. So if anyone has any thing they'd like to ask. Yeah. Here. Thanks again. A great panel. Uh, my question is actually some of you guys already uh, touched upon. You know, when we talk to potential uh, people, especially have more experience on the venture side, you know, they're basically the same advice as you guys mentioned. So don't come to us so too soon. And, and you know, the, all these non-diluted monies out there you're supposed to chase. But then on the other hand, I mean, I really want you guys to tell us when is the right time to actually uh, start the conversation with you. Thank you. I can jump in here. That's a great question. And I'm I'm glad you brought it up because it's kind of a, a corollary, which is, although we might not be ready to invest at that time, um, relationships are critical. And my favorite time to connect with someone is when neither of us needs anything. Um, and it's really <laughs> kind of a genuine organic relationship and we can build that. And, um, you know, I love talking to, to early stage companies. Um, this goes back to, you know, why I, I enjoy connecting with tech transfer offices. I like talking to folks early on and, you know, help them say, hey, you know, here's a good experiment that you should do. And, um, you know, when you, when you have that uh, opportunity to develop those relationships, then, um, you know, when it is the right time, you've already kind of developed a, a relationship of trust and it's much um, better for everybody to sort of move forward. And I would say, you know, when when a, you're having a conversation with an investor and they say it's too early, you should actually, you know, respond back and ask, what kind of data package are you looking for? That's a very reasonable and fair question. And you're going to get different answers from from different firms. Absolutely. There's, there's going to be a wide range of answers, um, but they should be able to tell you that, you know, and um, and then you can, you know, sort of use that to 
figure out, uh, you know, when the right point is to reach back out. And, you know, I do recommend that if you have some sort of a substantial update, you know, you send us sort of a, a little email saying, hey, just wanted to let you know we, we had this progress, um, you know, whether that's, you know, in six months or in a year, you know, just having that, you know, sort of refresh of the touch point. So it's a great question. Yeah, it's a really good question. I'm, I'm going to just add on to it, having been both on the university side as well and now the, the venture side. I, I, I've, I've learned, actually, um, that, uh, so first of all, we all, we all know that venture capital, like, right, there are, you receive, you know, the hundreds of approaches you receive, you invest in one, right? Like, that's, that's how it works. But if we don't have the information, we're not going to be able to make that investment. And so, like, we have a Salesforce database that we use to track all the companies. We're tracking 9,000 active companies right now, right? But we're going to make a handful to, you know, uh, you know, several investments per year, new investments per year. We do the same thing where we're not like a one and done conversation type of venture firm. We want to know about the opportunity and we'll track it. And if you get feedback from us, like here is what we would want to see. And you follow up and say, hey, we did that. Like, that's fantastic. We have actually a number of the investments that we've made were investments that we passed on the initial rounds. So you do have to do that follow up. It's a lot of like working with venture people is a lot of work. We, we totally get that. Like it is not. And it's, and the other thing that again, but going, you know, working both in academia and now venture is that um, you're going to get a lot of rejection. And I realize on the academic side, you know, that you're like, yes, you get a lot of rejection as well, perhaps for grants, et cetera. You're going to get even more rejection from the venture side, and um, and sometimes that can be hard. And so sometimes it makes people kind of nervous, like, oh, like, do I really want to keep pitching to these investors? And they ask, you know, these questions, and they're not experts in the field. Well, you have to help educate them, um, but realize like they're they're on your side. They want to find the best opportunities, but the vast majority of the time, they are looking for every reason to say no until they can't say no anymore. So, um, and just to your particular question about what we invest in, like we invest from seed to pre-IPO rounds. Um, we typically are not a lead investor. So we typically are a co-investor. So it's just understanding what that is that we're looking for at that time and understanding that and then taking perhaps what we tell you about why we're not going to invest, um, you know, if we're not going to invest, maybe we will. <laughs> um, yeah. But taking that feedback and then being willing to re-engage, it's, it is a slog to talk with venture investors. Like if you get if you get a yes right away, like that's that's amazing. <laughs> I just I just want to piggyback on on Kristen and Jenna's reply. So plus one on um, you know what they said. Uh, I've seen this with academicians when they're pitching to investors. A brilliant if you have their attention. B um, if you have a one hour time with them, please manage your time and don't do a 45 or a 50 minute pitch and leave 10 minutes for feedback. No, do the opposite. Pitch for 20 minutes, get feedback for 40 minutes. And I'm nine out of 10 times or 10 out of 10 times, it's going to be a no, but use that feedback to to improve uh you know in the coming months and years and i've i've seen investors you know once they like the idea you know it's a it's a no from them but they want to see more data like some of them are on you know text basis with a lot of founders hey you know um haven't heard from you any updates so it takes two three four years even before you know some investors put in their first check but you have to plant the seeds early and get to know the investor and what they're interested in. So yeah, just I just realized we didn't actually answer part of your question, Definitely. which was actually um, when do I approach VCs? At what stage of my company? To... Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I apologize. I'm going to jump back to that. Um, so venture capital, as we said before, is very expensive. Um, usually, you're looking to venture investors when you're raising millions plus of dollars. If you're raising hundreds of thousands of dollars, you're not looking for venture capital, right? Um, so um, and in the life sciences industry, you're going to be raising at least 5 million, but most times, time, like if you're in therapeutics, you're raising tens of millions of dollars typically at that point. So it's, it, and then it is what it is you're doing with that capital. So the venture capitalists are going to say, like at this stage, I would be expecting you to do A, B, and C with that particular capital, making sure that's aligned with it. So, um, I hope that answers, uh, that part of your question. Sorry. Hey, great panel. Laura Savatsky from University of Louisville. 
One of the comments that Pooja made kind of tongue in cheek at the very beginning around chat GPT being our person of the year um, sparked my imagination. And the panel right now has been focusing on what we've learned from the past, the changes we've experienced in the past 10 years and this rapid amount of change. What do you all predict are going to be the things we need to be um, ready for in the future around this space of investing in early stage tech? Are there big changes on the horizon in any of your minds? While they think about that, I'll say the big change is that this week, the Lasker Award was announced and it actually is based on some AI related drug development things. So it is not tongue in cheek completely that times person, thing of the year, innovation of the year is that. So and it is moving in that way um, very much. Those folks from Google and their deep mind were received that, so. Yeah, so speaking about the investment landscape, if we had to track, you know, the trends uh, in investments in the healthcare life sciences landscape, there's been a significant uptick in investments that have gone towards companies that have adopted AI to truly differentiate what they're offering um, and what their product is. So um, that's that's happening. The other thing that we've seen is even early stage um, companies, uh, it's it's not atypical for them, uh, you know, to be asked or to be acquired at the early stages by, uh, you know, corporates, uh, industry partners, because the appetite is is pretty significant at this point in time. But I'm sure others have more to add. As much as I hate to do this, Nicole, can you wrap I was actually going to say thank you. I mean, we could all go on forever. But I think what we've heard today is that engagement and investing on the time and the relationships is just as is critical to get the financial investment that they're all here. But the investment on your side is is equally important. So I just want to ask you all to thank, give us a round of applause to thank our incredible panel.